Cycling is very much a physically demanding sport, but the more you do it, the more you realize how big a part psychology plays. In this video, I'm gonna give you tips and tricks that you can implement to hopefully squeeze out a bit more speed or just squeeze out a bit more of the enjoyment and experience of the sport we love to do. The great thing about these techniques is you don't need to, well, go and be on a horrific diet or go and do an extra long five hour ride. No, this can be done anywhere, anytime. Psychology in sport and in cycling has been very much documented over the years, especially at the pro and top level, finding every tiny advantage to beat their rivals. Some say cycling is 20% well, physical and 80% mental. But how do we tap in to that 80%? How do we get the most out of it? How do we go and enjoy our riding that bit more? Now I'm going to go through a few techniques that us cyclists can put into practice out on the road to kind of better our experience and get better on the bike. But I'm no psychologist, so I did manage to get in touch with Dr. Chris Hartley, who's a sports psychologist and lecturer at Stirling University here in the UK, to kind of find out what he says about cycling and the psychology of sport. I'm here joined with Dr. Chris Hartley from Stirling University and hopefully, Chris, you're going to kind of give me a slight insight into what we're going to be doing today and also why psychology is so important. So I guess we should start off with that really big question that I guess all the viewers are going to be asking. Why is psychology so important and how can it kind of transform you as an athlete? Thank you, James. I think it's a, it's a great question. And to be honest, a lot of people might think about sports psychology and the psychology behind cycling as something that's a bit of a, a dark art or a bit of a mystery. And it probably brings to mind for most people the chimp paradox by Steve Peters. But um, one thing I would like to stress is that um, if you think about you know, what, what cycling is effectively, it's a series of behaviors, right? And your mind and the thoughts you have, the emotions you feel will impact on those behaviors. So actually your ability to cycle to, well, to cycle to the best of your ability, but also to get the most out of the cycling experience, it is ultimately governed by mental processes, by the thoughts you have, the motivations you have, the feelings you might either use to your advantage or that you might wrestle with and they might get in the way for you. Um, and I could actually just flip the question right back to you, James. Um, based on your riding experiences and experiences of racing in the past, you know, how, if you were going to put a percentage on it, how, how big do you feel the mental component was to your own performances? I mean, it's huge for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> 100%, because if I feel stressed before an event or I feel super nervous, I mean, I've had moments where I've been on the start line at a national event with a big crowd, felt so nervous that it's actually completely screwed my performance. Mm -hmm. And then I've had moments where I've turned up at a race, I felt really good, really confident. I've seen myself visually winning the event and done incredibly well. It gives you that extra sense of, um, uh, I guess it gives you a little bit of extra energy. And we can kind of use that as well, going back to the Tour de France, if you're wearing you know, the Mayo Jean, it kind of is said to give you that extra boost, that extra 10%. So, oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking a big high percentage, you know, 70, 80%. Yeah, and that's mental. That's usually what you find people say. They say it can be 50% upwards towards 80, even 90% of your performance could be governed by the psychology of your performance. But the irony is that, you know, we spend so much time out on the bike doing long rides. We spend a lot of time maybe even doing conditioning work, looking at our nutrition. And I'm willing to bet that most viewers out there, how many hours have you actually dedicated to developing that mental side of your performance? So it is clear that psychology can play a massive part. So with that in mind, Chris has come up with a list of techniques that you can do out on the bike. And hopefully you can train yourself mentally as well as physically. So the first thing that I would like you to do is to just build awareness of how you react to things when you're out on the bike. The mind is really good at hooking you with all sorts of thoughts and feelings, some of them more helpful than others. I almost like to think of it as there's a future magnet, your mind will get drawn towards thoughts about things that could happen and go wrong, but there's also a past magnet where your mind will get drawn to things that have gone wrong, things that 
that you think about that might not be very helpful while you're out on the road. So your first task, James, is just to notice those things, write them down. You could even, if you wanted to look extra cool, ring a bell on your handlebars every time you notice yourself getting hooked with a thought or a feeling and try and notice what kind of impact that has on your riding. So just build that awareness to start with. So I've been tasked with noticing my thoughts. Straight away, I'm thinking the weather. Today is pretty grim. It's uh, rainy, cloudy, quite slippery. So I'm gonna take a little bit more care and I'm gonna go that little bit slower, especially on the descents. And then I've got hills. I've got a 7% climb and a 20% climb on that route. So straight away, I'm thinking, oh, don't like climbs the best times, especially in the wet and the cold. So uh, yeah. I guess I'm gonna be feeling a little bit of pain there. And then it's length, it's gonna be a long ride, so hopefully I'll get through it. But I guess I've got to stay positive. Here it goes. Okay, James, now that you've had the opportunity to build some awareness of how you tend to react to things when you're out on the road, I'm now gonna invite you to try and create a little bit of space between that reaction so that you can hopefully produce a more calculated response to when they do show up. So for example, we could see that in the lead up to the tour, Bernal encountered a range of setbacks. And also in the tour, he encountered a range of setbacks. You know, and it's unavoidable in sport, that's always going to happen in one way or another. The key thing is though, he didn't just react to those things and engage in a lot of unhelpful ways of riding, behaving, etc. He kept pushing on in spite of those setbacks, right? So that was a calculated response that he was able to do in that situation. So what I want you to do is to just be mindful when you do find yourself getting hooked by those things and just try and notice them curiously. The best example I could give you is next time you're out on the bike and you're feeling pain, perhaps you're doing a big climb, just see if you can almost take a little bit of a step back and notice the pain curiously. Almost like you're a curious scientist who's never encountered pain before. And if you do that, you give yourself that bit of space to realize actually pain is just a sensation. It doesn't have to control my actions. So let's give that a go. Ah. Easier said than done. Ah. Right, those are the climbs done. I've got to say, definitely noticed the pain, but this time didn't act on it. I was just thinking, the pain's there, it's just sensation. But yeah, definitely easier said than done. Okay, James, now that you've built that awareness of how you tend to react to things on the road, and you've also had that opportunity to create some space between the reaction and the response by being mindful of the sensations that show up in a non-judgmental manner, the next thing I'm gonna invite you to do is you're gonna have to make a choice of what to do with the thoughts and the hooks that do show up, okay? So, simple experiment you can try. Just dangle your arm down by your side, and tell yourself over and over again, I cannot control my arm, I cannot move my arm, I cannot lift my right arm. And as you do that, just lift your arm. And that will hopefully show you that you don't have to let your thoughts control your actions. I also personally don't believe we have as much control over our thoughts as we like to think we do. For example, you can't just delete your earliest childhood memory if I was to ask you to do that, okay? So we have to make choices with what we do with thoughts when they show up when we're out on the road, okay? Pogacar didn't let his thoughts control his actions. I'm pretty sure he had lots of thoughts while he was out on tour that were negative, unhelpful. Sometimes he might have felt like easing off a bit, but he chose what he wanted to do with those thoughts when they did show up, okay? So my suggestion for you is next time you're out on the road, you find a thought come up that's perhaps a bit unhelpful, like I'm not really feeling up for this, I'm gonna get dropped, this is a massive climb, that sort of thing. Just thank your mind for that thought accept it, stop struggling with it. Your mind's just doing its job of trying to distract you. So make that choice to just accept the thought and persist with the task at hand anyway. So the first uh, task is um, telling my arm not to lift up, but well, lifting my arm anyway. So uh, take note all, 
I cannot lift my arm. 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 I cannot lift. I'm lifting my arm. Right, so I guess that does mean that my thoughts don't control my actions. So yeah, this time I've got to put it into practice. So on this climb, I'm going to find it hard. I'm going to attack it and I'm going to want to stop, but I'm going to persist. There you have it. That was a hard effort. I felt the pain. I wanted to stop, but I didn't. Kept on with it. And definitely, well, I reckon I did a pretty good time there. But I guess I've been in this situation quite a lot, especially in races, where you're on the back, you're in the gutter, you're suffering, and your mind, your body's telling you to stop, but you don't. You push on, and that's actually where you get probably the best results. So definitely give that one a go. Now the fourth tip is that I want you to try and choose helpful stories. Now what I mean by that is we can all relate to a rider or a friend who probably tells themselves unhelpful stories about the kind of rider they are. For example, I'm not someone who can ride hills or I'm not fast on the flats, that sort of thing. And actually they kind of sell themselves a bit short even before they have the opportunity to try the task, right? So for example, you might be someone that says, I love pain, okay? And that might be a helpful story to tell yourself in some situations. So your next task is a fairly simple one. I just want you to get a mate to call you out on the kinds of stories that you tell yourself when you're out on a ride. Some of them might be helpful, like I love pain, I'm a good climber. Others might not be so helpful, like I'm slow on the flats or I'm not really up for riding in wet weather. And what I want you to do is to just try and be flexible with those stories you tell yourself. It's your chance to be the kind of rider you want to be. So choose to tell yourself helpful stories about you and just notice what effect that has on your riding. I guess this is a technique that I'm most familiar with, telling myself that I can do it and I can get through the challenge and I feel good and I'm enjoying that pain. I mean, think, 1903, the first, yeah, the first time I did a 24 hour challenge with Mark Beaumont, didn't think I could do it, but I persisted with it and I told myself I could and completed the challenge. And then there's 24 hours with, didn't think I could sit on a bike for 24 hours, especially on turbo, but I managed to do it. And then there's the trenching, then there's coast to coast, then there's penny farthing, then there's sunset ride, then there's the 300k across Wales. And out of all those challenges, I've completed all. And I guess that's all thanks to my mental state and telling myself I can achieve it, I can do it, and not only that, I can enjoy it. But thinking of enjoyment, well, I'm not really enjoying this what wet. What about a hike? You love riding in the rain. Ah, true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, James, so last tip for you now, last exercise I want you to try. Uh, it's about changing your metric of success. How do you measure success when you're out on the road? And my top tip here is that it's not all about positivity, okay? Because things do go wrong. We don't have a lot of control over the things that happen when we're actually out on the road or when we're out racing, right? So a lot of people choose to measure success by saying, oh, if I won this race or if I got top 10 finish or if I get calm on Strava, that sort of thing. Um, the problem is, is that we can't always control those things because someone else might always have a better day than you. Things go wrong. You might get a puncture, etc. right? So what we tend to find is that it's more helpful if we focus on controllable processes rather than uncontrollable outcomes, okay? Uh, I think a good example, actually, if you look at the tour again, there was an interview of Pogacar before the final time trial. Uh, as you know, he, he was one minute down from Roglic, but he managed to put two minutes back into him, okay? And Pogacar, before the race, there was an interview where he said, he said, from start to finish, I'm going to go full gas. He didn't say, I'm going to win this. Can you see the subtle difference there? It's process going full gas rather than outcome, I'm going to win this. Because no matter what the outcome, he can always control if he's going to go full gas or not, okay? Even if he had lost the time trial, he didn't come first, he would still have been a success because he would have still been able to go full gas. So things go wrong. Sometimes it's helpful to focus on those small controllable processes instead because you're much more likely to achieve them. So next time you go out on the road, James, rather than saying things like, I'm gonna get calm on this segment or I'm gonna 
get a top two finish in this next race, that sort of thing. Say things like, I'm gonna commit to pushing hard on this segment, or I'm gonna commit to just showing up for the race, or I'm gonna hang in there and finish the race. That's the difference between focusing on an uncontrollable outcome versus a controllable process. For this interval session, I've got three times up banner downhill, but I'm not gonna think about the KOM, I'm not gonna think about the speed, I'm not even gonna think about my max power. I'm gonna think about the process. So I'm just gonna think, well, go balls to the wall as hard as I can and just uh, well, see how I get on. See you guys in three. <sighs> One last thing you could try is going to do a two hour ride on your own and then go do that same ride with a group and just see which one's faster and which one you enjoy most. Sometimes actually riding with a group will distract you from all that pain and suffering and you'll end up doing it quicker. So give that one a go and let me know in the comment section below how you get on. So I hope you enjoyed all those techniques. I've got to say, I've loved actually trying them and doing them and putting them into practice. A massive thank you to Dr. Chris Hartley of Sterling University for giving up his time and creating those techniques that we can try out and about. If you enjoyed this video, then give it a big thumbs up. Let us know if you tried those techniques in the comments section below, how you got on, and I'll see you in the next video.